Hi. I've brought with me something. And I've got a news for you. Well, the news is this is not a solution to everything. It wasn't really a news, right? All of you knew it. Despite that, various innovators in different fields fail to make a dent in their enterprise because they stay confined in their field boundaries. They keep applying one tool only to their efforts. What is needed for complex problems of today is multifaceted attack. What is needed is nuanced thinking, appreciation of grace. Today I'll be talking to you about that kind of synthesis where all your efforts synergize and synthesize towards the same goal. There is also a flip side. If you do too many things and the efforts don't add up, you might be spreading yourself too thin. So it's about the right balance. And this right balance can take a bit of work. Slide here. So this journey need not be very easy. What is uh, the case that it took me several years to reach that balance. When I first um, moved to US in 2003, I was doing various things. I was passionate about my science. Over a period of years, I have developed an interest in brain sciences, which I continue to do. I have developed interest in developing new medicines and also artificial intelligence. But what I did in parallel, I was an artist. And I also realized that after moving to US, the society is very different and wondered if developing countries could be transformed in some of the same positive manner. That activism costed me dearly. It didn't make a lot of difference. It made me feel happy that I'm doing something, but it didn't make much of a difference. In fact, I ended up pe pe running pe rubbing people's shoulder the wrong way. In 2014, there was an attack on my social media. Accounts were hacked. One year down the lane, the culprits were identified. But that was too late. Damage was done. I still wake up with nightmares that what damage it did to people around me, not just me. Later, when I returned to India, I faced several attacks. But I'm not here to tell you about the sad story. I'm here to tell you about how to emerge as successful, how to emerge as winner from those experiences. But what that activism, what that desire to change the world in, gave me was the, an experience to use various people, to be able to organize a large number of people towards a good cause. And that has led me into citizen science, where I'm able to utilize large number of undergraduate students, large number of master's students, towards doing crowd science, towards doing citizen science. So now the model is not science, art, and technology separately and some kind of activism. That activism has transformed into data science. Now I just believe that if you can bring truth forward, if you can bring facts forward, people would make best decisions possible for themselves. So now the model is science, technology, and art. Being a bit creatively inclined, what I did was that I expressed this theme also through art. So I used my paintings to tell this autobiographical story of transformation. And I also put it out in form of poetry, in form of appreciation, with, where I said, let's celebrate a new world, a new world which just explores innovation. I tried to also work on juxtaposition, juxtaposition of poetry and painting, where it was my paintings with a friend's poetry or my own uh, poetry with my own paintings. So the theme of paintings, I'll tell you, which might uh, seem very unconventional, but it is in the same theme and it was um, talked about by critics, again, as a new synthesis, the same talk as of my topic. Uh, the idea was creative destruction. I painted one layer. I threw it out in snow, rain, ice, sun. I brought it back in, painted another layer on it. That layer would destroy the previous layer. Then I would do the same process over and over again. Sometimes this process would be repeated 70, 80, or 100 times. So each layer is destroying the previous layer. It was metaphorical for the idea that efforts of your each day do not add up. And in the end, you just end up painting a fake smile over it. Then I moved on to the second series, which was the reverse of that process, which I call destructive creation. I'll paint, but I'll wash off that painting immediately. That painting left some mark. So it wasn't as bad as sort of the first approach. So each layer would add up giving rise to a final painting. But the final thing, which, were, which I call breaking free. So I painted all the things which synergized together. It was breaking free from any art form. It was breaking free from abstractionism. It was breaking free from realism. It was breaking free from expressionism. It was like what you want to finally express, all of it should come together. So let's not think of art forms. Let's just think of the message. So in that, 
instead of painting one experiment or one scientist, the final thing that I pointed to was complex patterns. And that's what unites all the efforts I do, is understanding patterns. The same data science, in neuroscience, in drug discovery, in fine arts, everything is about finding patterns, finding meaning. If you can find patterns in things around you, you can succeed. So that was the journey. And how do we go about it? I'll talk to you about it. So one of the first things we do, we try to learn from local knowledge. And the way we go about it is we work amongst different tribes. And what you can do, if you think you're a biomedical professional, you're a researcher, why would you go around looking for knowledge of different aboriginals? The interesting thing is, we've been able to find different plant sources which can cure several complex disorders. Not every local knowledge, not every bit is going to be validated in lab, but a good fraction of it would be validated. And you can come up with drugs, you can come up with solutions to complex world problems. So that is one thing, learn from people. I would ex actually encourage a lot of my fellow researchers to go out in field and not just stick in lab. The other thing that we do, is citizen science and data science. Can you utilize power of undergraduate students across the globe? There's so many people who are looking for research opportunities. Can you do something with that? The answer is yes, the answer is resounding yes. For example, in a country uh, like say India, you don't have a lot of data available. You want to find out what is happening with alcoholism in say some part of Northeast and you look through government records and you have very little information. Can you send boots on the ground? There are people who want to do, have this research experience. You can send boots on the ground and find out about statistics of all these things. If you want to utilize a plant and say, can that plant be used in a sustainable manner to make drugs, to make plant extracts without basically removing it from circulation entirely, you can send boots on the ground and have that research experience. We have gained tremendously from citizen science. But what we have gained more from, interestingly, is data science. Programming is becoming a new necessity. It's not an optional skill anymore for the current generation. Most of us know how to speak at least one or two languages. Just like speaking two languages is becoming a norm, programming is becoming a norm. If you can code and you know statistics, you can be a data scientist. What we have been able to do is to scrape through information in newspapers, look through social media, find out information from government and international agency data sources and make sense of it. Let us say you want to fight alcoholism. You want to also not fight it in a simple black and white manner. You want to say there is a positive to alcohol, there is a negative to alcohol, and you want to fight it in all its nuances. Chronic alcoholism is a problem, occasional alcohol drinking may not be. You want to get data about it. How do you go about it? Get a bunch of programmers. They need not be sitting in your office. They need not be in your lab. They could be in some engineering college across the globe. So we have been able to utilize the power of citizen science by doing data science. For example, it'll just take you a day to find out something shocking, like we found out about HIV in India, that from 2008 onwards, most of the news coverage is entirely about taboo. There is hardly any news coverage about number of patients suffering. There's hardly any coverage about lack of medicine availability, any information specific about the places they can go to. You can find out things which can result in actionable intelligence, which can make any society, whether it's in Western Hemisphere, whether it's in Eastern Hemisphere, a better society by just finding out that data. And this is an example of one day versus you can put in a one year of activism on ground where one day of your effort can give more results for society. So this is the way. It's not that my passions have changed. The passion to change society has remained the same. Just the means have become digital. So data science is extremely interesting. Citizen science is extremely interesting, but you need to work in lab to produce cutting edge biomedical research. And there are two, three things that keep me up at night. One thing that really troubles me is the cost of drugs, the cost of medicines. An average medicine that comes out in market for let's say a complex neurological disorder is costing you above of $10 billion in research before it gets to market. That prohibitive cost prevents a lot of medicines to be around, right? For example, there are diseases. There are so many people suffering from diabetes. 
you need more medicines, but why are they not coming out? The cost is very prohibitive. There are so many people suffering from depression. Why is it not coming out? The cost is very prohibitive. Can you again use the logic of grace, appreciation of nuances to make this drug discovery better and faster? What we are doing in our lab is instead of working with one model system, we are working with several model systems. And the logic is what works in several model systems is more likely to work in humans because of the logic of evolutionary conservation. Now, using that logic, we are also employing other things of technology. What we are doing is we measure multiple parameters and not just one parameter at a time. Because if you measure one parameter, it will go to the clinical stage and then you'll realize it's not really working. So there you use artificial intelligence to make sense of a lot of data. So artificial intelligence can help uh, biomedical research a lot. But it's not just one way, it's a two-way street. So artificial intelligence can also learn a lot from biology. So artificial intelligence can learn a lot from biology. Need to change back. Um, what it can learn is that brain works in very complicated manners and it has evolved to be intelligent, but the systems have really, artificial intelligence systems are working where we had the information of brain sciences 20 or 30 years ago. It's working with the logic of synaptic plasticity. It's really not uh, gone ahead. What we are trying to do is to transform artificial intelligence radically by bringing in themes of inhibition, by th bringing in themes of neurogenesis, by bringing in architecture which is previously defined, by bringing in conduction delays, by changing how a node computes. These are concepts which artificial intelligence has not. And the idea of working in different fields enables you to synthesize from one field, take it to another, work in another field, bring it to another. So my biology is helping make AI better, and my knowledge of AI is helping make my biomedical research better. So you need to cross two fields, and it would not have been possible if I had just stuck to one field. That is why it's very important to move across different fields. What is also important is not just keep doing research in lab, reach out. Write in newspapers, write books, and what I have realized by doing that, you don't have to dumb it down. When people say simplify, simplify, but do not oversimplify. People are capable of understanding nuances. People are capable of understanding grace if they are interested. A lot of my friends complain about the fact that people don't care about their science. If you're not talking about your science, who else would? People complain about politicians are not funding science enough. If your message is not going across, there would not be a reason to think that science should be funded. One, is, one thing is very important, that it's not a one-way dialogue, it's a two-way dialogue. You also learn from people and you correct yourself. You might have some beliefs from your knowledge and what you realize that not every solution is applicable in every local context. So you learn from people and then you apply that. What is also a very interesting thing in reaching out is do not restrict yourself to writing newspaper articles or books. I have done that a lot and I learned that they are somewhat elitist unfortunately because not everyone is spending a lot of time reading. That's the sorry state of things but that is how it is. So can you reach out through art? So right now I'm trying to make paintings which approach the theme of alcoholism, various neurological disorders but that again might have a limited audience. Can you sing about it? So I'm collaborating with a friend who sings really well and writing lyrics on the theme of virus. There are hardly any for common people. If they're suffering from some disorder, where do they get help? What kind of help do they need? We're also making a IoT podcast, IoT and data science podcast to reach out. So the idea is reach out and reach out by all means necessary, all means possible. Do not restrict yourself to one means. So one conclusion I would say from my talk is cross discipline boundaries. It's a lot of fun when you don't restrict yourself to be branded as any kind of a scientist, just be an innovator. The other thing I would like to talk to you about is my, are my dreams and my plans. So I have a bit vivid imagination and I'm pretty sure all my dreams would not be fulfilled and that's all right. I'll be very happy if I can achieve half of them but I'll tell you what I'm thinking of. So I, the biggest thing that I have is I want to reduce this multi-billion dollar cost of drug discovery down to maybe a billion, maybe one day to few millions. So more and more medicines for various disorders can come out. So we can have a healthier and a happier life. That's one of the biggest dreams. There's another dream. 
So I've been working on design of something called transcranial magnetic stimulator. Machine already exists, but right now you can activate or inactivate only large parts of brain. What I want to do is make it very focal, very small. You can stimulate different parts of region, change connectivity in brain, right? Maybe upload new memories like matrix, upload different things. Well, that, I'm joking about the matrix part, but what you can do is cure people who have, let's say schizophrenia, people who have depression, where medication is not working, can you do that? That's one of the things I'm hoping that I'll be able to do in the next few years. Then there is another dream. So we have been working through data science on epilepsy prediction. Can the same prediction approaches, which are working in nuances, what we are doing is we are taking subtle approaches of simply putting logic gates. We are not getting married to one algorithm or another. We are not getting married to hard computing of autoregression based tools. We are not getting married to artificial neural networks. We are simply putting logic gates of OR and AND, putting in weighted average. Can I use those prediction approaches where we are being very successful in predicting epilepsy to being able to one day predict earthquakes? Can we do something for stock market and maybe come up with the next big company? So I have various dreams in science and technology. I have some crazy dreams in art also. So in addition to trying to make paintings on different neurological disorders, I have, something has been vexing me for a long time. Are people, when they buy art, do they buy it because they care about the signature of the artist or do they care about the painting itself? So what I want to paint is paint something but cover it entirely with red pigment. They don't know what the painting is. When they go back home, they can wash away the pigment and that's when they know what they bought. That'll be an interesting experiment. That'll be an interesting social experiment and I want to find out what the results of that are. I also want to make paintings which age as you age. So make different layers which come off. So paint with different chemicals which come off with age. One year later you see a different painting than what you bought. And then I'm working on a th theme where I'm trying to use the ideas of how technology has transformed art. So there are a lot of dreams. And as I said, my strengths are finite, my resources are finite. I might fail in several enterprises, but we as a group of people, if all of us become citizen scientists, our strength would be the largest strength that the world has ever seen. We can transform the world. If all of us are aware, of, all of us are contributing to innovation in some manner or, or another. Imagine a world where facts dominate petty politics. Imagine a world where everyone can innovate crossing discipline boundaries. That is what I want to do. Imagine a world where we have a new renaissance because a new renaissance is needed to solve complex problems that vex the world. Thank you.